Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. The final countdown to COP26 has started, and South Africa seems fairly well prepared. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss government's negotiating stance and its plans to canvas a just energy transition financing facility. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Could you tell us what COP26 is and what's on the agenda? Well, COP26 is a big global gathering of governments uh, to discuss the progress, try and make progress on the climate change agenda. We know that the big breakthrough was made in 2015 in Paris, where there was an ag agreement to sort of limit global warming to uh, below two degrees above pre-industrial levels. And that was a big significant event. Uh, but post that, things sort of collapsed with the US withdrawing from Paris under uh, President Donald Trump. And subsequently, Biden has rejoined. So there's a, a bit more excitement around the Glasgow event, which is taking place late October, early November, to try and up the ambition even further beyond Paris and to try and get us onto a pathway of 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial temperature. The sort of framing is to try and get ambition back into the, the global multilateral system around climate change and to get as many governments as possible committing to those sort of pathways. And uh, really the big th issues on the agenda are to sort of tie up loose ends from Paris in 2015, but really to get more money in the system really uh, for uh, mitigation and adaptation. So mitigation is where you lower carbon emissions, uh, either in your electricity system, your mobility, your heating, your industrial, your buildings. And then adaptation is to try and build climate resiliency uh, in cities, in towns. So really, uh, climate change is mediated through water, either none of it, so we have droughts and therefore these intense fires, intense heat, or you have too much of it and you have the floods, as we've seen in many parts around the world. And uh, you need to build up resiliency in, say, cities uh, or towns to have, for instance, if you don't have enough water, to have a desalination, for instance, as a possible solution to build up water reserves, or you've got too much water, uh, or two intense storms, uh, which is also the, the consequences to have uh, your infrastructure that is able to be resilient to that. So there's a big focus, especially from the developing world, to get more finance for adaptation in particular. Uh, we know that the, in 2015 there was a pledge, or it was even the pledge was made even before that in Cancun, to $100 million a year uh, from rich countries to poor countries. But most of that is flowing if it's flowing at all, uh, to mitigation projects. So there's this issue around balancing uh, where the finance goes more to adaptation because many of these countries don't, haven't contributed one to carbon emissions and don't have huge carbon emissions to abate, but they are very vulnerable to climate change and therefore more resources are needed for adaptation. So the, the financing element is going to be a major focus, the rebalancing between mitigation and ad adaptation finance is going to be uh, a major component. And then there's all these cleaning up around how carbon markets work, how the rule books work, and what countries offer in terms of their nationally determined contributions, which is their basically their decarbonisation plans. How has South Africa been preparing for COP26? I think <coughs> South Africa has always been a major participant in COP. We've always been well prepared, but I think this time we've been even better prepared, better consulted. Um, I think the, the Department of uh, Forestry, Fishery and Environment has, has led this with really getting out early a public consultation around our new NDC, our new nationally determined contribution. They put out a, a consultation on that and there was time for society to digest it. In parallel, the President had set up the President Climate Commission, which seems to have teeth, seems to have clout, and was able to make some very important comments around uh, that NDC. And in the end, we have a cabinet endorsed NDC that's, that's really very progressive. You know, we as a country that still relies very much on coal and it's quite difficult for us to move quickly away from coal. But basically we've made a commitment uh, to reducing our carbon emissions, mostly from our electricity sector and mostly from coal uh, in a band that's much more uh, uh, ambitious than what we proposed in 2015. And that really pro provides the framework for us to enter COP on the front foot. So we, we're going there 
with a band that is at least aligned, so at the upper end of the band, the 420 million tons of carbon dioxide by 2030 is aligned to the Paris Agreement of keeping uh, temperatures below the two degree level. The bottom end of the, the band, the 350 million tons, is more aligned with the 1.5 pathway and South Africa's aspiration, not yet commitment, to move to a net zero emissions economy by 2050. So we, we seem well prepared. We have our negotiating positions. We want to see ambition on financing, on mitigation, on adaptation, and on cleaning up those loose ends from the COP uh, that took place in Paris. A big focus for the South African negotiators is on securing a finance breakthrough. Yes. You know, there's that's $100 billion a year commitment from 2020 to 2025 that rich countries, I think, made it back all the way back in Cancun and was re reinforced uh, in Paris um, to say that that's the money that's going to flow into, th into the world. Those commitments have not been met by the rich countries. Um, some would say predictably, but we have had this wobbly around the, the a major economy in the form of the U.S. withdrawing the fact that they're back in the fold, that may be uh, useful. There's also been a lot of shift in thinking over the period. I think countries understanding that climate change is a reality, that they're experiencing in their own economies, that it is a global problem, and there has to be some fairness in the system. I think there's been some pennies dropping around the world that you can't expect countries that, uh, one, haven't really contributed massively to this, to be the main finances of mitigation, and they're very vulnerable. And two, that there needs to be more money for adaptation, as we spoke previously. So South Africa's uh, got some very firm proposals around defining adaptation, what it means, what climate resilience means, because that's always been a bit of a, a nebulous term, and rich countries have said, you know, how are we meant to finance this? So there's some firm proposals around that, sort of having 30% of the world or 50% of the world climate resilient by 2030, which is highly ambitious, and I'm sure will be highly contested, and 90% uh, of the world by 2050. So it will be contested, but it's, it's, it's a firm proposal. But we've also got a very firm proposal on financing. We're saying that we need a visibility beyond 2025. One, you haven't even met your commitments to 2025. We're not seeing the money flowing as it should. And two, we don't have any visibility. Uh, and we've got huge uh, multi-trillion dollars worth of uh, mitigation and adaptation necessary in the developing world. And yet there's no sign of support beyond 2025. So there's going to be a push there. And I think Minister Barbara Creasy's proposal, which I'm sure is going to be resisted, but we'll see is that uh, the floor should be $100 million a year from 2025, and it should rise progressively to at least $750 billion by 2030. So it's, these are quite ambitious uh, proposals by South Africa, uh, but from the basis of mass making quite a progressive commitment on our NDC. So we're showing that we're prepared to do our bit. Uh, you need to do your bit. On the sidelines of COP26, government will also be promoting a just energy transition financing facility. Yes, this has been the big focus of the national discussion uh, in South Africa. We know that uh, Eskom is broke and broken and needs finance to do really not just new generation, not just renewable energy, because a lot of that's going to be coming from RPPs, but really to create the, the, the infrastructure that is necessary to evacuate that power and move it to where it's needed. So uh, grid strengthening, grid expansion, distribution network expansion. We know that the weakest link increasingly um, is becoming um, municipal distributors in many parts of the country. That's come to the fore very much in this election. So we've got this discussion also around a just energy transition and saying as we decarbonize, as we put in more renewables, as we move away from coal, we have to protect the workers and communities and businesses linked to the coal value chain, which is really centered in, in the Mpumalanga province. So there's been this national discussion around this. And Eskom has been, again, quite progressive in its thinking around how do you leverage COP? How do you leverage the climate finance that's coming available? There was a lot of talk at the World Bank IMF meetings uh, last week about climate finance, the need, the willingness for these uh, funds, to, these monies to now become available to developing countries. So there seems to be money in the kitty. South Africa wants to make an approach 
uh, to try and access both grants, which I think are, will be limited in this world. Uh, grant funding, uh, I mean, it would be the most just solution for many countries, including us, but also to get concessional uh, loan funding. So that will be our just energy transition financing facility that we will canvas really on the sidelines. So there's the main COP agenda is really about the architecture uh, that the world needs to adopt around adaptation, mitigation, financing. Um, and we've got our, our mandated propositions there. But on the sidelines, everyone's there. The world is gathering in, in Glasgow despite the overhang of COVID still. Uh, there seems to be a lot, there will be a lot of world leaders. Some might miss uh, the event. I mean, uh, President Cyril Ramaphosa's own participation is going to be uh, constrained by the fact that we have a municipal election that he, he needs to be around for, I think, and the COP is starting and those are key days. So even our own leader, and we've been quite uh, um, supportive of COP26, so there's other leaders that have not showed their, their hand yet as to whether they're going, but lots of people will be there, multilateral financing institutions will be there, other lenders will be there, business leaders will be there. So to use this opportunity of this platform to, sh to canvas, what do you think of this deal? Uh, government has now approved it, it's a cabinet approved financing facility, it's no longer merely an ESKIM facility. Part of that will be ESKIM, the most advanced part of it, ESKIM says it needs 400 billion rand uh, to do the grid, the distribution and the generation that it wants to do, and, um, let alone what we need for our own energy system from RPPs or our own electricity security. So there's that, there's also the added uh, transition in our manufacturing from internal combustion engines to electric vehicles. So now we've got a big automotive manufacturing industry in South Africa and that needs to transition or become stranded. And then they've also added the green hydrogen into that mix. So it's quite an ambitious package. And the issue here is that to go and have these engagements to say this is how we see this financing facility uh, multi-year, so over 15 years, three tranches, uh, of money that can go in from international syndicates at very concessional terms that will be distributed on a, a pay per performance bonus with an opt-out clause which is very important because a lot of multilateral finances can no longer finance gas for instance and Eskom's plan does include some gas to power so with opt-out uh, provisions so it's well considered the issue is getting South Africa aligned and I think uh, th there's been quite a lot of behind the scenes work and getting cabinet approval is a key thing but getting especially Treasury on board because they're nervous about what it means for Eskom to take on more debt. Now Eskom has said yes we are have an unsustainable debt position, yes we need a debt solution but many climate financiers still think they're ready to do project finance, related finance through this very simple mechanism that we're proposing. So Eskom is bullish Treasury is somewhat reticent, but the, the indication we got, there was a PCC meeting this week, indication we got from uh, that meeting from the Treasury, from the Director General, was there was a collegial approach that they, they do have concerns, but they didn't have firm red lines around what, what they would, that they definitely will not support climate deals. So it's about getting the best deal for South Africa, getting one that we can afford getting one that we can pay for over the long term and uh, is uh, just for future generations we'll have to pay off this very long term debt. Thank you. That's the second tech show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis. Also, don't forget to listen to the audio version of our engineering news daily email newsletters.